Have prophets played a role in Confucian tradition? Confucian tradition developed in ways very different from the so-called prophetic or Abrahamic traditions. Confucius and his disciples never claimed to have received a revelation from above. They did not consider themselves privy to divine secrets. Their job was to call people back to social responsibility, however. And in that respect they share an important characteristic with the classical prophet figures of other traditions. Confucius also felt himself called to speak of justice to those in power. Much as Israel's prophets and Islam's prophet Muhammad challenged the rulers of their day. But on the whole, Confucian tradition and its literati were much too closely identified with imperial rule to function as effective critics of the system. Some scholars distinguish between prophets as seers, and people of action, like Confucius, as doers. One such Confucian seer came at a time when Confucianism was waning as the theory behind CIT. Liaoping, 1852-1932 CE, considered himself and Confucius prophetic figures. As it turned out, he was a minor player. Known perhaps best of all for his lament over the demise of imperial Confucianism. Think of him as the exception that proves the rule. Are music and dance important in Buddhist religious ritual? Formal Buddhist rituals generally do not incorporate music as such. With the exception of more recent denominations that have absorbed practices from Protestant Christianity. Chanting and rhythmic recitation use tones other than those of normal speech but are not usually done to musical accompaniment. Buddhist rituals do, however, make extensive use of a wide variety of sounds and percussive devices. Bells, gongs, drums, hollow blocks and clappers of many sizes are standard equipment in different areas of temples and monasteries. Large and medium-sized bells signal the beginning of worship services. And Zen masters use smaller bells to signal the end of sessions with individual monks. Large drums announce the time for certain exercises and gatherings. The most common ritual use of sound devices is that of keeping time during recitation and chanting or scriptural texts. Hollow blocks make a hypnotic clop to focus the attention and heavy bronze bowls emit a rich lingering note that reminds worshippers of the impermanence of all things. The combination of sustained warm bell-like tones punctuated by stark wooden percussion is very effective and surprisingly easy to listen to. Buddhists in various parts of the world sometimes use music and dance paraliturgically that is. Outside of their primary ritual settings. Zen meditative mood, for example is often associated with the haunting sound of the bamboo flute called the shakuhachi, and Tibetans have traditionally used vigorous dancing in ceremonies such as exorcism and other protective rituals.
Are there Shinto rituals of marriage? Weddings in Japan have traditionally followed Shinto ritual, and the vast majority still include Shinto elements even when performed in connection with other traditions, such as Christianity. Until recent times, however, weddings occurred in homes and were performed by laypersons only. Since the mid-19th century, shrine nuptials performed by Shinto priests have been more common. A ceremony called Shinzenkeken, nuptials in the presence of kami. May take place in a wedding hall on shrine grounds or in other public spaces. According to some, a marriage deity called Musyubi no Kami, the god who ties the knot, is a Japanese counterpart to the moon dwelling deist, Yulao, who bound together the feet of marriage partners. Many Japanese continue the ancient practice of arranged marriage. And some young couples still live with the groom's family, following Confucian traditions. At the heart of the wedding ceremony is a shared drink of sake, rice wine. Many Japanese families still value elaborate ritual as a form of social communication. And some will even have two ceremonies, one Shinto and one Christian, for example. Deist influenced traditions still recommend that couples be wed only on days determined to be auspicious. What happens to texts not judged worthy of inclusion in the primary canon? Judaism and Christianity, for example, characterize works of secondary value as apocrypha. Hidden because originally associated with esoteric groups, or pseudepigrapha, works written under assumed names. Study of canon formation is very instructive in the history of religion. Since it reveals a great deal about how certain beliefs and teachings came to be regarded as central to a tradition. Are there any organizations that have their own distinctive structures within Daoism? Monastic institutions have been of great importance in the history of Daoism. Celibate monks adhere to demanding disciplinary codes. The five basic rules of Daoist monastic life are not. Unlike some of the essential regulations of Buddhist laity. Monks are forbidden to take life, to eat meat or drink alcohol. To lie or steal, or to engage in sexual activity including, of course, marriage. But like their Buddhist counterparts, Deist monks face far greater demands as well. Fasting is a large element in monastic life. Including ten fast days each month plus dozens of others scattered throughout the year. Historically, different orders required adherence to additional regulations varying in number from ten to several dozen. Some orders structured their membership according to levels of spiritual attainment. For example, the Realization of Truth School had three grades among its monks. Noble transformation characterized the master of excellent conduct who successfully managed the first set of challenges. 
abiding by a set of 300 specific regulations. Brought a monk to the level of master of noble virtue. To achieve the level of nobility in the Deo, aspirants had to match the immortals themselves in virtue. Is fundamentalism the same as literal interpretation of a scripture? Fundamentalism is an approach to religious teachings and values that emphasizes strict and direct reliance on a tradition's most ancient sources. That often means interpreting sacred texts quite literally. But even among fundamentalists extreme literalism remains the exception rather than the rule. Fundamentalist exegesis is found in many religious traditions. A major hermeneutical principle seems to be this, take the text literally. Even if its literal meaning seems quite impossible in human terms, but interpret figuratively where a literal reading is clearly. Absurd. If the book of Joshua says the sun stood still, take it as an actual divine intervention. But when Jesus says I am the vine, you the branches. It should be obvious to all that he is using a figure of speech. Alas, such things are not always so obvious. In general a fundamentalist approach seeks to interpret a sacred text by means of the sacred text itself rather than appeal to the intervening history of interpretation that comprises the community's repository of tradition. If I visited a Confucian temple, what would I see? Major Confucian temples are arranged along the same general lines as traditional Buddhist and many CCT temples. All influenced by the plan of the imperial residence. Simple but elegant formality sets the Confucian temples apart from the others. Most Confucian temples greet the outside world through a main gate on the south side of the surrounding outer walls. Here is what you would see if you visited the Confucian temple in Taipei, Taiwan. Whose plan is unique by reason of local tradition. Through either the eastern or western portals, you enter a garden with a pond. The high walls recall the master's parable comparing great teachings to unscalable ramparts. That preserve the building's secrecy, so that one must work to gain entry through the door. From there you pass through doors on either side of the main gate into a forecourt that offers further opportunity to shift mental gears before approaching the heart of the temple. Local tradition has it that there the main south gate must remain closed to all. But those scoring highest on imperial exams, since no one from the region ever achieved that rank, the south gate remains closed except for special occasions. Walking northward you pass through the gate of rights into the main courtyard. Surrounded by rooms built into the outer walls. Immediately inside the inner gate you find yourself in one or another of the temple study rooms. Where do Shinto practitioners live today?
Any estimates of numbers available? By far the majority of people who identify themselves with Shinto tradition still live in Japan. There are also Shinto shrines in many areas of Asia, and a few elsewhere as well. In which significant Japanese communities have developed? Honolulu's Shinto Shrine, for example. Is a highly visible sign of a large and prosperous Japanese community there. Accurate statistics as to membership are hard to come by. Largely because an increasing number of Japanese do not identify themselves as religious at all, even if they continue to engage in some traditional Shinto practices. We do, however, have fairly reliable information about numbers of shrines and active priests from which we have some idea of the tradition's vitality today. Some 20,000 priests serve between 80,000 and 100,000 shrines. What are some of the principal names and forms of God? One of the first questions non-Hindus ask about the imagery of Hinduism's deities is why the multiple limbs and non-human features. Hindu tradition answers why not, since no one can know definitively and in detail what God looks like or how God operates. God sees fit to allow human beings to describe the indescribable. God is by definition beyond anything in human experience. So Hindu tradition often depicts the deity in clearly non-human form. Names of the deities always have some symbolic meaning. For example, Vishnu comes from a root that means to pervade. Alluding to the divine omnipresence. Shiva means auspicious. Traditional sources often pun on the name. Suggesting that without the I in Shakti, Shiva's feminine side, Shiva would be Shiva, corpse. Ganesha's name is a compound meaning lord of the attendant Vedic deities called Ganas. Shiva's terrifying feminine side is called Kali dark. As for their multiple forms, Hindu images of deity remind believers of the infinite variety that makes God God. As a reminder of the perfect balance of energies, most male deities have a female counterpart. A popular image of Shiva in both painting and sculpture depicts the deity as half-woman lord. One side of the body male and the other displaying the features of Shiva's consort Parvati. As a reminder of God's complete dominion over all forces and conditions, including those most of us would rather not have to deal with. Hindu deities appear in shocking and even terrible forms as well as in attractive and approachable aspects. There is a hierarchy among divine beings. A ranking that naturally develops within each denomination or sect. Among Shivas, Shiva is the supreme deity to whom all the others defer. For Vaishnavas, Vishnu, or one of the avatars heads the list. How do the Christian scriptures describe Jesus? Weaving together historical fact, interpretation of pre-Christian sources. 
and an emerging understanding of the circumstances in which the earliest Christians found themselves. The Gospels provide insights of various kinds into the life and identity of Jesus. The four Gospels are not historical biography in the modern sense of that term. Behind each of the Gospels is a particular theological view about who Jesus is. A concrete example will make this clear. Matthew and Luke both include genealogies of Jesus. Not only are the figures mentioned not identical, but the two authors approach the matter quite differently. Matthew opens his gospel with the genealogy. Tracing Jesus from Abraham forward through David and the Babylonian exile. Emphasizing his Jewish lineage and explicitly calling him the Christ, the Messiah, Matthew 1 colon 1-17. Luke inserts his genealogy just after John baptizes Jesus. A scene that ends with the voice of God declaring Jesus his beloved son. Luke then traces the line backwards through history all the way to Adam, the son of God. Luke 3 colon 23 38, emphasizing the universality of Jesus in our shared humanity. Taken together the Gospels give this general picture. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and raised in Galilee by devout Jewish parents. He was well educated he quotes scripture liberally and reads in the synagogue and His belief in immortality of the soul and resurrection of the body suggests that he had more in common theologically with the Pharisees than one might at first suspect. After perhaps 30 years of relative anonymity, Jesus' public life began with his baptism in the Jordan. After his initial desert experience, recalling the Exodus, he worked in Galilee. Gathered followers, and turned toward Jerusalem for Passover. John says little about the Galilean period and has Jesus attending three Passovers in Jerusalem. After cleansing the temple, Jesus gathers the twelve for the Last Supper, after which he is arrested, tried, executed, and rises from the dead. Luke's Acts of the Apostles picks up at that point and describes the post-resurrection appearances and Jesus' ascension into heaven 40 days later. What is the Imperial Oath in Japan? The following oath is taken from the 1889 Constitution of the Empire of Japan. It was spoken by the Emperor in the Sanctuary of the Imperial Palace, we. The successor to the prosperous throne of our predecessors, do humbly and solemnly swear to the Imperial Founder of our house. And to our other Imperial ancestors that, in pursuance of a great policy coextensive with the heavens and with the earth. We shall maintain and secure from decline the ancient form of government. In consideration of the progressive tendency of the course of human affairs and in parallel with the advance of civilization. We deem it expedient, in order to give clearness and distinctness to the instructions bequeathed by the imperial founder of our house and by our other imperial ancestors. To establish fundamental laws formulated into express provisions of law, so that, on the one hand, 
our imperial posterity may possess an express guide for the course they are to follow, and that on the other, our subjects shall thereby be enabled to enjoy a wider range of action in giving us their support. And that the observance of our laws shall continue to the remotest ages of time. We will thereby give greater firmness to the stability of our country. And promote the welfare of all the people within the boundaries of our dominions. And we now establish the imperial house law and the constitution. These laws come to only an exposition of grand precepts for the conduct of the government. Bequeathed by the imperial founder of our house and by our other imperial ancestors. That we have been so fortunate in our reign, in keeping with the tendency of the times as to accomplish this work. We owe to the glorious spirits of the imperial founder of our house and of our other imperial ancestors. We now reverently make our prayer to them and to our illustrious father. And implore the help of their sacred spirits, and make to them solemn oath never at this time nor in the future. To fail to be an example to our subjects in the observance of the laws hereby established. May the heavenly spirits witness this our solemn oath. Have there been any important Confucian reformers? Wang Yangming, 1472-1529 CE, was an outspoken government official of the Ming dynasty. He was perhaps the most influential teacher of the Neo-Confucian school of mind. Also known as the Idealists, Xi and Shui. Wang believed that the teaching of his predecessors in the Neo-Confucian movement had lost all. Credibility when UN dynasty bureaucrats made it the official curriculum for civil service examinations. Reduced to a fixed set of questions and answers. Neo-Confucian ideas no longer required people to think independently. Wang's major work, Investigation into the Great Learning. Commented on the ancient Confucian text, underscoring the need for active engagement with ideas. He condemned slavish adherence to rigid canons of ritual propriety. Wang argued for an understanding of Li as a living universal principle rather than a list of prescribed procedures and policies. He borrowed from Deist and Buddhist teachings, as earlier Neo-Confucians had done. Attempting to reinvigorate the tradition as a way of interpreting the whole of life. And Wang reintroduced a metaphysical element by speaking of a true self and a heavenly principle. Above all, he insisted, one must not lose sight of the underlying challenge of human development and the struggle for moral improvement. Institutionalize what is meant to be a living tradition, Wang warned, and you create a giant fossil. Who was Confucius and what do we know about his life? Confucius was born around 551 BCE and died in 479 BCE. Making him an almost exact contemporary of the Buddha. 
the name by which he is most commonly known, Confucius, is a Latinized form of Kong Fu Zi, Venerable Master Kong. According to tradition, his mother, Yan Zhengze, had prayed on Mount Ni that she would have a child. Confucius' father, Xu Liang He, died when the child was three years old. And his mother raised him under difficult circumstances. At 19, Confucius married and had a son and a daughter. His marriage, which was not very happy, would end with the death of his wife. And his son died during Confucius' life. At 22, he began the first of several jobs for the state of Lu. At 26, some say 33, Confucius went to the Zhou dynasties. Imperial capital of Lu to study royal ceremony and seek a government position. There he is said to have met the aged Lao Zi. Traditional accounts of that meeting. With a decidedly deist slant, report that Lao Zi took Confucius to task for wasting effort on formal study and reliance on ethical absolutes. He would do far better to observe how nature accomplishes all good things without contrivance, effortlessly. Still Confucius pursued his effortful path. He spent many years teaching privately and sought to win converts to his ethical and political views. At about 50, he won a minor governmental post. But he failed to gain the public recognition he craved. Hoping to find a willing political patron. He went into a 13-year self-imposed exile, wandering in and out of nine provinces. Confucius returned home at the age of 68 there to spend his last five years studying and editing the classics. The master had a passion for fostering the kind of order in society that he felt sure could offer genuine happiness. He sought to articulate a view of the individual who could contribute to society through self-mastery and personal responsibility. Does the form of ritual suicide called Harakiri or Seppuku have Shinto connections? Ritual suicide has sometimes been associated with Shinto by way of the Samurai Code of Honor. The principle behind taking one's life has been that one can be cleansed. Of shame incurred through bad judgment or ill will by means of suicide. Harakiri means literally belly cutting. A grim ritual in which the subject disembowels himself with a short blade while kneeling. His second then dispatches the subject by decapitating him with the longer. Samurai sword. There have been few publicized instances of the ritual. Also called by the preferred and more polite term seppuku, in recent times. Surely the most famous such act was that of celebrated novelist Yukio Mishima. In 1970, most people no longer consider ritual suicide in any way laudable or virtuous and certainly do not think of it as part of Shinto religious belief. Is there such a thing as Confucian art?
A number of Confucian literati have been credited with some of China's finest landscape paintings. They were particularly attracted to this artistic theme and medium. Because both were consistent with deep-rooted Confucian values. Images of mystic mountain settings shared scroll space with equally. Haunting poems that reflected on human life and the grandeur of nature. These visual and literary images were sometimes autobiographical in tone. Offering insight into the creator's personal spiritual convictions. Paintings often depicted solitary scholars lost in contemplation of natural beauty. Meditating on moonrise or creating calligraphy in a mountain pavilion. Here Confucian tradition crosses paths with classic deist views of nature. And with the spontaneous and abstract landscapes painted by Chan Buddhist monks. Painting and poetry became forms of meditation for the literati. Expressions of their holistic view of the balance and harmony of nature. Literati painting is a didactic art with ethical impact. For ideally it expresses the feelings of the superior person. Confucian theory accords visual art the ability to Communicate ideas too delicate or too forceful for words. The mind of the artist takes precedence over the content of the work. For the ultimate benefit of a great work is that it offers a connection with a person who represents the highest moral values. Great art can arise only out of genuine virtue. What is a Sufi? The word Sufi seems to derive from the Arabic word for wool, Suf, pronounced Suf. Among the first generations of Muslim Sufis were ascetics. Spiritual athletes who strove to detach themselves from whatever distracted them from worshipping God. Garments of rough wool symbolized their desire for a simple life. Some of these early ascetics gained a reputation, often much to their personal consternation, for holiness. But some early seekers of deeper spirituality found ascetical discipline and self-denial an unsatisfactory path. A woman of Baghdad named Rubia, d. 801, pronounced R-A-A-B-I-A, -A -A, gave expression to a fierce longing for God in bold, shocking love poetry. How dare a mere mortal talk of a loving relationship with the infinite God? Rubier was the first true mystic, an inspiration to many who would risk all to communicate the unspeakable. Some, like Halage, d. 922, would die for their presumptuousness. Accused of blasphemy and fatally misinterpreted, thus sharing the fate of mystics in many traditions. People everywhere sought out these spiritual beacons for guidance and blessing. Communities gathered around some prominent Sufis and eventually developed into formal organizations called Tarikas, pronounced Tariqa, meaning path. Over the centuries dozens of major Sufi men and women have left a legacy of poetry, arresting insight and leadership. Jalal ad-Din Rumi, d. 1273, the original whirling dervish, is one of the more famous classical Sufis. 
translations of his poetry now ranking among the best sellers in the United States. In some parts of the world, such as the Central Asian republics that made up the southern tier of the former Soviet Union. Sufi orders have been responsible in large part for the very survival of Islam through very difficult times. Many international Sufi organizations now maintain websites. Some teach that one does not need to be a Muslim to be a Sufi. But it is nevertheless important to keep in mind that Sufism is a genuinely Islamic phenomenon. What is comparative religion? Comparative religion draws on the information supplied by all available sources for the history of religion. Scholars look for possible parallels between one tradition and another in the belief that common themes can offer insights into how the traditions developed and how their teachings differ or reinforce one other. We can talk, for example, about what kinds of beliefs and practices are characteristic of a tradition. How various communities of faith are organized, what sorts of signs and symbols a tradition uses to express its central teachings. And what kinds of special calendars different traditions follow. Comparative religion is not just about looking for similarities. Differences are every bit as important. And in the end, what we're seeking is greater insight built on an overall picture that is as fair and balanced as good scholarship can provide. What is the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the only begotten, born of the Father before all ages. Light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made. Of one substance with the Father through whom all things were made. Who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven. And was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, and became man. He was also crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered, and was buried. And he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. In one, holy, catholic, and apostolic church. I profess one baptism for the remission of sins. I expect the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Are dreams and visions significant powers in Daoism or CCT?
an ability to interpret the dreams of ordinary people has long been part of the ritual menu of Chinese religious specialists, beginning with the shamans of old. In ancient times, specialists called Zhan Ren interpreted dreams using divination and astrology as their tools. Powerful and famous people, too. Report having revelatory dreams that move them toward a new course of action. Dream accounts therefore frequently function as an instrument of divine or spiritual legit imation. There is often a very fine line between dream and vision. Except that one can experience a vision while awake. Religiously important visions or dreams frequently feature major deities. Such as Lao Zi or the Jade Emperor, who deliver instructions or revelations to the dreamer or visionary. In addition, visualization techniques figure prominently in the meditative practice of some deist schools. The Shangqing School, for example, recommends that the meditator focus imaginatively on his or her indwelling deities. A technique similar to that used by several Tibetan Buddhist schools. By conjuring up intricate detail as described in the school's sacred texts. The meditator makes the presence of the god real and can thus unite with the divine presence. What is jihad? Jihad, pronounced G-H-A-A-D, comes from an Arabic verb that means to struggle or exert oneself. In recent years both Muslims and non-Muslims alike have bandied the term about so. Loosely that one has to do some digging to retrieve an accurate understanding of it. According to news reports, everyone from the scarcely devout Saddam Hussein to Osama bin Laden and the Taliban has called for a jihad against somebody, usually the West. Hence the virtually automatic translation of jihad as holy war at best a misleading, and at worst a highly inflammatory, interpretation. Jihad does have a range of precisely defined meanings in Islamic tradition. Under prescribed circumstances jihad can include offensive military action where the free practice of Islam is under threat of constraint. Many scholars in recent times have held that one cannot justify an offensive jihad unless Muslims are being persecuted religiously. Even then, therefore, we are talking about a type of defensive action. Military jihad has always been subject to strict criteria and is in many ways parallel to the Christian notion of just war. Very few, if any, recent calls for jihad have actually satisfied the necessary criteria. Muslims also speak of various nonviolent forms of jihad. One can battle injustice and evil through jihad of the pen or the tongue, for example. When someone asked Muhammad what the greatest jihad was, the Prophet replied that it was to speak a word of truth in the ear of a tyrant. An important theme in Islamic spirituality has been called the greater jihad. As distinct from all the various forms of exterior, lesser jihads. Warriors of the spirit must take up the sword of self-knowledge against the fiercest enemy of all. Their own inner tendencies to evil and idolatry.
what moral options are available as solutions means to salvation, in other words. Everything from altruistic service to others to the pursuit of enlightened self-interest. From quiet contemplation to extroverted worship. And from active cultivation of good deeds to hopeful resignation in the face of a foreordained outcome. Are sadhus, sannyasis, and yogis all the same kinds of people? These three common terms refer to different specific religious roles or functions. Any or all of which could be exemplified in a single person. They are often used synonymously but there are important differences. A sadhu is a person of unerring trajectory or one who has achieved a goal by means of a regime of spiritual practices and disciplines called collectively sadhana. These methods encompass a whole range of external rituals, including fasting and other austerities. And forms of meditation, and often vary from one denomination or sect to another. Sadhus pursue a highly ascetic lifestyle, live on charitable donations, and are often entirely unconnected with specific social or religious institutions apart. From the fact that sadhuhood has become virtually an institution in itself, some sadhus are also sannyasis, renunciants officially initiated into this spiritual status by a guru. Individuals may formally enter into the state of sannyasa for various reasons according to tradition. A spontaneous quest for spiritual liberation, a quest resulting from more deliberate immersion in religious studies. Withdrawal as a way to cope with great loss or sadness, or the realization that one's death is imminent. Formal initiation, also conferred on women in some orders, includes vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience for those who belong to monastic communities. Sadhus and sannyasis may also engage in the disciplines of Raja and Hatha Yoga. But a yogi is not necessarily either a sadhu or a sannyasi. What is an ascetic? An ascetic is a person who engages in a demanding exercise. From the Greek ascesis, in the interest of spiritual progress. One of the ascetic's chief goals is freedom from the encumbrances of material existence. Various forms of self-denial and increased attentiveness to inner. Movements of spirit are therefore at the heart of ascetic practice. Fasting use of the simplest possible clothing and other material needs. And the cultivation of solitude are common themes in ascetic discipline. In many religious traditions ascetics are known for their observance of silence for long periods. Ascetics vigorously pursue detachment from all that is not conducive. To realizing one's nothingness in the face of ultimate reality. These spiritual athletes often appear to others to be going to unhealthy extremes and in relation to widespread societal norms of ordinary behavior, they can indeed be extremists. 
Some ascetics are known for such practices as sitting atop pillars for long periods. Staring at a blank wall for years, or lowering themselves head first into the depths of a well. But there is another important way of understanding asceticism. Every human being who works hard at living a good life practices asceticism at some level. The ordinary disciplines of dealing with life's predictable setbacks, of treating others with consistent kindness, and of shouldering all of one's responsibilities are forms of asceticism. Most religious people must make the most of the ordinary opportunities. Allowing their traditions professional ascetics to remind them occasionally of the need to look deeper in the quest for spiritual freedom. If not, how can one say that God is just? Sheol becomes identified more as recompense for an evil life. But is gradually replaced by the concept of Gehenna. Just south of Jerusalem lies a small valley that may at one time have belonged to a man named Hinnom. Hence G.E. Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. It must have been a most unpleasant place. Long-standing tradition associates it with fiery punishment. Possibly because it had been a place for incinerating refuse in ancient times. As a parallel to this abode of deserved misery there must surely be a place where the good are rewarded. Perhaps near the dwelling of God himself. Generic notions of the heavens as a place above earth appear very early in biblical thought. Gradual spiritualization of the idea of heaven went along with the notion that there are multiple levels. The third of which is a paradise for the just. All of this is linked to the idea of resurrection of the body. Taught by the Pharisees and accepted as a rule in post-biblical rabbinical tradition. Apart from the trigrams and taiji, what are some common traditional symbols? Ancient lore associates fundamental features of Chinese cosmology with specific symbols. It all goes back to the Chinese atom, Pengu. In his task of imposing order on primal chaos, Pangu enlisted the help of five cosmic assistants. Azure Dragon, White Tiger, Phoenix, Tortoise, and Unicorn. Pangu assigned to each of the first four a quarter of the universe. Azure Dragon governed the East, associated with spring, new life, benevolence, and protection. White Tiger ruled the autumnal west, symbol of maturity and a life well spent. All made possible by good government and courage. Phoenix, the ultimate solar bird. Presided over the summery south with the kindly warmth and joy that arises in a world at peace. Hard-shelled and indomitable, the ageless tortoise faced the unforgiving, wintry north. Wandering freely among them all, the rare and delicate unicorn was commissioned. To appear wherever and whenever benevolence and justice reigned on earth. It is not surprising that all five of these wondrous beings retain their appeal to. 
the popular imagination and remain essentials of the religious symbolic repertoire. A cluster of items associated loosely with Daoism are called the eight Daoist emblems. Each represents one of the eight immortals, a group of human beings who became immortal in various ways. They appear often as decorative motifs on all kinds of objects. The emblems are a fan, a sword, a gourd, castanets, a flower basket, a bamboo drum, a flute, and a lotus flower. This is one of several sets of eight motifs popular in Chinese art and along with the eight Buddhist emblems, one that still carries specifically religious resonances. Are doctrine and dogma the same thing? Doctrine in its general sense means teaching or instruction, from the Latin doctrina. Both as an activity and as collection of specific beliefs or principles. It is sometimes used in a non-religious sense, as in the geopolitical posture called the Monroe Doctrine. A warning that other governments that exert undue influence in the Americas should not be surprised if the United States pushes back. As a religious concept, doctrine means specifically all the individual teachings that a tradition identifies as essential. What is a menorah? Menorah means an object that emits light, hence a candle holder. A seven-candle menorah was used in the ancient temple and has continued to be perhaps the most widely known and used Jewish symbol. When the Romans despoiled the Jerusalem temple in 70, they carted away all the temple's riches. They regarded the menorah as such an important emblem of their conquest that the Emperor Titus had it depicted on his triumphal arch in the Roman Forum. Some scholars suggest the menorah is a variation on the symbolic tree of life that grew at the center of the original Paradise Garden. Versions of which are widely used in many cultures and religious traditions. An eight-branched candlestick, now also called a menorah, features prominently in the eight-day observance of Hanukkah. Is there such a thing as heresy in Islamic tradition? Muslim tradition recognizes varying degrees of deviation from pure faith or iman, e-e-m-a-a-n. Certain forms of departure from strict Quranic teaching and practices clearly identified as deriving from the Sunnah of the Prophet have been labeled innovation, bid'ah, bid'ah. Some things once considered innovations such as attaching minarets to mosques, have long since become widely accepted. All but today's most traditionally minded Muslims give little consideration to this category. A daily danger for all human beings, one that Muslims seek to combat constantly, is called shirk, or associating partners with God. 
Any undue attention or attachment to that which is not God is thus a form of shirk. But while it is a natural tendency, it is not necessarily a permanent condition unless one chooses to make it so. A more serious problem, known technically as deviation, ilhad. I-L-H-A-A-D, comes closer to what many understand by the term heresy. A mulhid is someone who deliberately strays from the broadly accepted tenets of the faith. Introducing innovations to the extent that one can know. Longer readily recognize basic Islamic teachings in the new formulation. Farthest from adherence to true belief is the category of kafir. The kind of willful unbelief that leads to outright blasphemy. Have women exercised leadership among Shinto practitioners? In ancient times, women played an indispensable role as shamans in countless Shinto shrines. Even after imperial decrees reduced women's roles in shrine life. Giving precedence to a male priesthood, women continued to fill some key positions. Well into the 16th century, for example, women functioned as priestesses in some shrines. The last of the priestesses was a young woman serving the Suwa shrine in Nagasaki. Women have long acted as spirit mediums consulted by many a priest over the centuries, as well as by individual worshippers. Restrictive legislation arising from the Meiji Restoration in 1868 dramatically curtailed women's official participation in shrine staff ministries. Only at the ISE Grand Shrine, sacred to the sun goddess Amaterasu, does a woman currently hold the position of high priestess? During the Second World War, many women took over priestly functions when their husbands departed for military service. Where and how do human beings have access to those truths? Preeminently through the marvels of nature, including the human. Shinto's deities do not reveal a message otherwise inaccessible to mortals. As is the case in the Abrahamic faiths, for example. They do, however, disclose to anyone who reflects on his or her life with a clear mind and heart all the truth human beings need. May women attend Muslim burial services? Women may attend funeral services at a mosque, though most mosques have separate sections for men and women. Sayings of the Prophet Muhammad recommend that women not attend burials because they might faint or lose control of their emotions. But the sayings stop short of barring women's attendance. Do Buddhists pray in any particular language? Even the earliest Buddhist practice apparently did not. 
require any particular sacred or canonical language for prayer. People recited the scriptural texts and prayed in their vernaculars. Among Theravada Buddhists, the Pali tongue, distantly related to ancient Sanskrit, has functioned something like an official or canonical language, since the Pali canon contains their full sacred text. But Theravada Buddhists across Southeast Asia also pray in their local languages. This all seems perfectly in character for a tradition whose foundational figure taught an egalitarian way that was neither based on any one sacred source nor structured according to any ancient hierarchy. Some of the more esoteric branches of Buddhism, however, retain the practice of using archaic texts that require special education to understand fully. Has martyrdom ever been important in Shinto history? Shinto tradition reveres many religious heroes who died defending their emperor and homeland. They are martyrs in the broadest sense of the term. They died not for a religious creed narrowly defined but out of allegiance to the larger complex of beliefs that has been integral to Japanese history and culture. People like the cultural icon Sugawara Michi Zain, who is said to have perished as a result of his convictions, take their place alongside the royal heroes, the princes who died in defense of the imperial house. Shrines designated as nation-protecting shrines are dedicated to the memory of war dead. They enshrine as kami the souls of all who gave their lives out of conviction. Yasukuni Jinjia in Tokyo is a fine example of such a martyr memorial. Do Hindus believe in devils? No single personification of evil functions in Hindu tradition quite like the Satan of other traditions. Multiple embodiments of malice, perversity, and general negativity are called asuras, or demons. Ancient myths tell of the ongoing struggle between the devas, deities, and the demons for control of the cosmos. Originally the demons were not necessarily considered altogether evil. Even their generic names are ambiguous, deva is from the same root as devil. While Azura shows up in the name of the main Iranian deity, Ahura Mazda. Both deities and demons descended from Prajapti, Lord of Living Things. Demons were at first ethically on a par with the gods. But the gods generally managed to win more battles than their siblings. Eventually the deities came to be known as more clever and more truthful. Finally, the gods achieved immortality while preventing the demons from winning that prize. Demons retain the ability to assume virtually any form in their attempts to disrupt cosmic affairs. Powerful people intent on evil could enlist the aid of demons to carry out their wicked deeds. Some demons came to represent impersonal negative qualities, such as ignorance. Lesser but still troublesome forces known as Buddhas remain important in the lives of many villagers. Buddhas are the spirits of those who died violently, or too young. 
or after betrothal but before marriage, for example. Resentful and frustrated, they wander about harassing the living unless appeased by proper rituals. Hindus believe that ultimately the divine power will overcome all demonic forces. What is a sacrament? Sacrament comes from a Latin root that originally referred to an oath by which soldiers swore their loyalty. Eastern Christians typically call a sacrament a holy mystery. Traditional Christian sources from a variety of churches generally define a sacrament as a visible sign of divine grace bequeathed by Christ himself. Since the Middle Ages, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians have held that there are seven sacraments of equal spiritual significance, baptism, confirmation, or chrismation. The Eucharist, penance, holy orders, matrimony, and final anointing. Most Protestant communities have accorded a central place to baptism and the Eucharist. Usually called the Lord's Supper, regarding the other five as of lesser importance. But some churches have recently begun to pay greater attention to those five as well. Almost all Christian communities practice baptism frequently, though in very different ways. As for the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, frequency varies a great deal. Catholic and Orthodox churches, for example, give Holy Communion as part of nearly every liturgical worship service. In most Protestant communities, the Lord's Supper is much more occasional and a ritual set apart from the usual Sunday worship. The Society of Friends, Quakers and the Salvation Army are the only larger groups that have no sacramental rituals at all. Where do religion and political power come together? Virtually every religious tradition has had to come to terms with its relationship to civil authority and power. As often as not, the relationship varies at least slightly from one political setting to another. Even in the United States, many traditions have shifted their positions historically. The standard and seemingly straightforward principle of separation of church and state has been reinterpreted in various ways. With prominent religious figures seeking and winning national elected office as high as the United States Senate. The situation has historically been still more complex where Political rulers have declared one religious tradition the state creed. That has often meant hard times for members of faith communities. That have not enjoyed official patronage and protection. Popular perception nowadays tends to label Islam as the tradition. Most likely to take political shape, as if no other has ever done so. But ample data from the history of religion suggests that questions of the relationship of temporal to spiritual power have arisen for virtually every major tradition at some time or other. Have relics ever been important in Judaism?
relics have generally not formed a significant part of popular Jewish practice. Reverence for the burial places of holy persons, however, does play a role. After the site of the former temple, tombs of the patriarchs and their wives have highest priority in the hierarchy of holy places. In the town of Hebron, not far south of Jerusalem and David's first capital. A mosque stands on what tradition identifies as the Cave of Machpelah. Accounts in the Hebrew Bible tell how Abraham bought the property as a burial place, and how generations of patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their wives, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, were laid to rest there. Rachel's tomb, not far from Bethlehem, has attracted pilgrims for over 1500 years. She was Jacob's favorite wife and the mother of his two youngest sons, Joseph and Benjamin. What signs or symbols distinguish ritual specialists in Judaism? Since the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70, there has been no formal Jewish priesthood. With the priesthood several other special ranks of ritual specialists disappeared. What replaced the priesthood was a more egalitarian system of rabbinical leadership. Nowadays, when Jews worship together, the community leader is not nearly so visually distinctive as in days of old. Since the nature of post-temple worship is radically different, leaders in worship are visually distinguishable largely by their being in front on the congregation, often on a raised stage. Temple priests once wore easily recognizable garb. In addition to the simpler vesture of the ordinary priests, with a full-length cloak and sash or girdle. The high priest's cloak had a hem fringed with gold bells and woolen pomegranates. He also wore a tall mitre with a blue band at the top and a gold headband. An elaborately decorated vestment called the ephod was worn over the cloak. Over that the high priest wore the breastplate suspended from the shoulders. Like a large pendant on a necklace hung down the front from epaulette-like onyx stones. On each of which were written the names of six of the twelve tribes. Attached to the breastplate were twelve semi-precious stones symbolizing the tribes. And inside the breastplate pocket were the Urim and Thummim, mysterious devices used for divination. Is there a Christian creed? A number of New Testament texts suggest early forms of creedal statements. For example, the letter to the Philippians 2:1-11 describes how Jesus emptied himself of all divine prerogatives, even to the point of becoming a slave and dying on the cross. The passage ends by saying that all should bend the knee at the name of Jesus and that Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. The Gospel of Matthew 28,19 records Jesus sending his followers to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, an early expression of the notion of the Holy Trinity. But the first important formal creedal statements did. 
not gain wide currency until the early 4th century. An important outcome of the Council of Nicaea, in 325, was the Nicene Creed. As has so often been the case in the history of religion. Christians first formulated a comprehensive statement of orthodox or right belief in response to serious challenges that threatened to distort ancient traditional beliefs. In other words, the Nicene Creed does not represent the first expression of these beliefs, but rather the first comprehensive clarification of points that had come under attack by factions now considered heretical. Christians all over the world now recite in their liturgies a later and somewhat longer version of the Nicene Statement. With sections devoted to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And concluding with affirmations of belief in the Church, baptism, forgiveness, and the resurrection of the dead in the next life. The liturgical formula does not include the anathemas or condemnations of unacceptable views contained in the Council's original document. Subsequent Church Councils have published other creedal statements, but the only other creed in common use. Outside of the Eastern Christian Churches, is the briefer so-called Apostles' Creed. Earlier versions of which seem to have come into common use around the 4th century.